Um, before we get started, I just wanted to say that, that I first met Mohsen Hamid, we met about a year ago um, on the program Worldview on WBEZ, and he was touring then behind his recently published new novel, How to Get Ahead, or How to Become Filthy Rich in Rising Asia, um, which is now out in paperback. And since then, I've gone on to read more of your work, and I am a huge fan of it. And particularly, I was reading Moss Smoke uh, in preparation for this evening, and you had this fantastic um, observation about public speaking, something I find rather intimidating <laughs> a lot of the time. You likened it to armed robbery. <laughs> that you know, it offers you an opportunity to be in the limelight for crowd control and also the potential of public humiliation. And then um, what you wear is a vitally important part of the proceedings. So <laughs> I really appreciate that insight and you've hit all the important elements of public speaking. You know, it's, um, um, public speaking is such a funny thing. Um, I remember when I was, uh, in secondary school, mm -hmm. there was a debate competition, and um, and for some reason I had was winning this debate competition. I had made it into the finals of this debate competition, nice. and I had to speak in front of this big audience. And I was so terrified of actually doing that that I sort of called in sick and you know didn't show up for the thing. So um, uh, luckily tonight I mustered my courage and showed up. Yeah, you're kind of an expert at this point. So I wanted to start, um, before you'll read from the book for us, um, but I wanted to start by asking you um, about why you chose to write this kind of epic, sprawling, you know, from birth to death, soup to nuts kind of narrative. Previously, your two previous books, The Reluctant Fundamentalist and Moss Smoke, were about these really, um, monumental shifts in a person's life, in an individual's life, or you know, big transformations and sort of how that person arrived at that point and then the consequences of that shift. This you've gone much wider in scale. And so why did you want to do that? Um, I mean, partly I suppose because I had done more focused books and I sort of wanted to do something a bit uh, bigger. Um, and, and partly, I think, it's just maybe a process of something related to just growing up. Um, uh, in my first two novels, as you've said, and, and thank you very much for the kind words that you said about them, um, it, they were focused on protagonists who came from slivers of society much more like mine and were you know, of, um, you know, similar to me in age and, mm -hmm. and you know, came out of uh, a close personal kind of experience in a way. Um, but the biggest change between the time when I wrote those books and now is that, you know, subsequently, while I was writing this book, um, I became a father, uh, have two children now, and moved back to Pakistan and moved back in with um, uh, my parents and live in this extended family household with grandparents, my parents. Um, parents being my wife and myself, mm -hmm. and children. And among the various weird things that, that resulted you know, out of this for me as a novelist um, were one, a sense, that, a sense of really feeling very powerfully drawn to, compelled by the idea of, of confronting sort of the arc of life from you know, birth till death. Um, I think living in an extended family with, with young children with older people and I guess myself now middle-aged um, that arc suddenly takes on a different role I'd never given it too much thought before to be honest and suddenly it was really important to me to say you know um, because one of the things about this arc is that it's it's you know there's obviously the beauty of the young children but there's also a, um, uh, you could say a kind of constant fear that comes with being aware of the arc of life because people that you love are getting old. Um, and you see, you know, living in Lahore, I attend a funeral every month. Um, when I lived in New York and London, I didn't attend a single funeral that I can remember, maybe one or two. Um, so, so partly that, I think, was a broadening of, of, of the canvas. And the other broadening was in terms of 
not just age, but um, background, etc. And I, I think partly why that happened for me was, it's related to the same thing of being a father, um, was I felt I had a new, I, I guess, in or, or permission to imagine people or imagine what it would be like to be someone. Mm -hmm. Because I, I could now think that you know, anybody is somebody's child. Um, so, so whereas before, I, I guess I gave myself permission to imagine people who seem more similar to me. I didn't feel I had permission to imagine people who were different, um, seemingly different. I now start to think, well, maybe people who are seemingly different aren't really all that different, actually. They are also somebody's kids and perhaps or perhaps not somebody's parents. Um, and uh, so, so I think um, my friend Suketu Mehta, the Indian uh, uh, wonderful nonfiction writer, um, once said that you know, there's two kinds of people. It's not whether you're poor or rich or Muslim or Hindu or whatever. He said, he said you know, that there are um, people who have young children in their lives, be their parents or aunts or uncles or whatever, and people who don't. And I don't agree with that characterization, I think, and I think he said it, he didn't mean it as a, as a serious statement. Mm -hmm. But he, he was touching on something there, which is that, you know, whether it's through having children or interacting with children or interacting with older people or whatever it is, a kind of broadening of empathy can take place. And at least in my, in my case, I feel the novel, this novel is really different from the others because I've become a little bit different. Well, it's interesting, um, so that kind of like the permission to imagine that anybody is somebody's child and that kind of like leveling of difference you were talking about. Yeah. The format that you've used, so you could describe this either as a novel in the form of a self-help book or a self-help genre in the form of a novel, that too has that kind of universal appeal, right? Anybody, any one of us, and probably most of us have read a self-help narrative at some point and it's always applied to us, right? Yeah. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about that choice, but maybe you could give us all a, a, a bit of what that sounds like, what that, what that reading experience is by reading from How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia. So this is the first, um, I'll just read the first one or two pages uh, to give you a sense of what it sounds like. And this is the first chapter. Each chapter is, uh, the title of each chapter is a kind of one of 12 steps towards actually getting filthy rich. And chapter one mm -hmm. is called Move to the City. And this is how it begins. Look, unless you're writing one, a self-help book is an oxymoron. You read a self-help book so someone who isn't yourself can help you. That's someone being the author. This is true of the whole self-help genre. It's true of how-to books, for example. And it's true of personal improvement books, too. Some might even say it's true of religion books. But some others might say that those who say that should be pinned to the ground and bled dry with a slow slice of a blade across their throats. So it's wisest simply to note a divergence of views on that subcategory and move swiftly on. None of the foregoing means self-help books are useless. On the contrary, they can be useful indeed. But it does mean that the idea of self in the land of self-help is a slippery one. And slippery can be good. Slippery can be pleasurable. Slippery can provide access to what would chafe if entered dry. This book is a self-help book. Its objective, as it says on the cover, is to show you how to get filthy rich in rising Asia. And to do that, it has to find you, huddled, shivering, on the packed earth under your mother's cot, one cold, dewy morning. Your anguish is the anguish of a boy whose chocolate has been thrown away, whose remote controls are out of batteries, whose scooter is busted, whose new sneakers have been stolen. This is all the more remarkable since you've never in your life seen any of these things. The whites of your eyes are yellow, a consequence of spiking bilirubin levels in your blood. The virus afflicting you is called hepatitis E. Its typical mode of transmission is fecal oral. Yum. <laughs> it kills only about one in 50, so you're likely to recover. But right now, you feel like you're going to die. 
Your mother's encountered this condition many times, or conditions like it anyway. So maybe she doesn't think you're going to die. Then again, maybe she does. Maybe she fears it. Everyone is going to die. And when a mother like yours sees in a third-born child like you the pain that makes you whimper under her cot the way you do, maybe she feels your death push forward a few decades, take off its dark, dusty headscarf, and settle with open-haired familiarity and a lascivious smile into this, the single mud-walled room she shares with all of her surviving offspring. What she says is, don't leave us here. So I've, you've told the story of why you decided to use the, the genre of self-help to write this novel and that it started as a joke, but then you started to realize there was something in that that revealed something about the way novels work or about the way writing and reading works for you. I'm really curious about how you did this, how you went about taking something that you know, is ubiquitous, is popular, some would say hackneyed, you know, something that you might buy in an airport or get handed to you at a conference that you regret signing up for, yeah. and made it into something that is so powerful and moving. And from the very first paragraphs of the book, we're with this you, this like unnamed protagonist who, in fact, does not leave us. You know, it's a, it's a funny thing. The more, I've, the more I've been thinking about this, and perhaps even since I saw you last, um, in a way, it, it's sort of fitting that we're having this conversation in a church. Um, and the reason why is because, um, uh, you know, if you think about how spirituality is discussed in pretty much any society, civilization on planet Earth, um, usually storytelling is a huge part of how you know, conversations around spirituality take place. And, um, you know, when I, when I began writing this novel, I didn't really think of it as I was trying to address a spiritual question. Um, but by the end, it became clear to me that that's exactly what I was trying to do. Um, except that uh, in a, not a religious way. So, um, you know, very often we have this thing where we talk about, you know, is something religious or non-religious, like there's some opposition between those two things. I don't think there needs to be, actually. You know, whether you call, uh, whether you call something a, a spiritual question or, or perhaps you call it a mental health question, depending on the vantage point you bring to the situation. Um, I feel like now, in a world where religion is becoming so politicized, um, and it's about, do you belong to this group or that group? Oftentimes, you know, religious discourse isn't fulfilling as much of the spiritual function as it used to fulfill. And meanwhile, non-religious discourse, rejecting spirituality or religion, whatever, um, it's one thing to say that you don't believe in God or gods or whatever. It's something quite different to say that the reason that people have for believing in these things is invalid. In other words, there's some human impulse that gives rise to spirituality. So, um, now, this joke about the self-help book, you know, what is self-help at the end of the day? Um, when I began with this idea that, you know, oh, you know, I'll write a self-help book was kind of a joke and it began to progress, um, it soon became clear to me that I needed help and um, <laughs> that I need help. You know, it's bizarre for a 42-year-old man to be sitting by himself for hours at a time, years at a stretch, staring at a wall, making stuff up. You know, <laughs> that's what I do. And, uh, and that's not normal behavior. And so, and so I started thinking that, you know, maybe this practice, you know, it's a daily devotion of a kind, um, where you try to transcend your day-to-day -day reality, isn't entirely divorced from you know, other practices that we might call religious practices. Mm -hmm. and, and, so, um, and so then, uh, one of the things that began to creep in was, you know, uh, in Pakistan, where I'm from, and where I currently live, well, I'm from many places, but where I'm also from, um, the dominant, you know, literary form is the Sufi love poem. 
And the Sufi love poem basically, so Sufism is, you could say, um, a subset of, of Muslim tradition, which is a mystical tradition. And just as you have mystical traditions in Christianity or Judaism or Zen Buddhism or whatever, um, Sufism is one of the mystical traditions within the Muslim uh, uh, tradition. And generally, um, uh, one of the things that Sufis often refer to is, is love as a way of understanding the universe and love as a way of transcending yourself and, and love as a way of, of, of uh, looking at, at life and the divine. And, and the way in which Sufism has been communicated in a place like Lahore is through epic love poems, often told to you, uh, the beloved. So the idea of a kind of um, epic love story told to you that, f that serves a kind of self-help function is actually you know, over a thousand years old in Lahore. So in a sense, what, um, what I became increasingly aware of as I worked was not that I was sort of you know, breaking new ground, but that actually I was wandering down a path which has existed for a very long time, but maybe isn't too common in the novel form. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I guess one other thing worth saying is, is that you know, when we talk about self-help, um, and, and the novel I think is in a sense a kind of self-help, but, but self-help is a problematic term because um, so much of self-help, you know, uh, uh, how to get six-pack abs and how to live to 100 and all these things is a kind of narcissistic thing, right? It's like, um, it's about, you know, me. It's all about me. And of course, what all of the great, you know, spiritual traditions and philosophical traditions that are not religious, but of, you know, humane and humanistic in orientation, seem to converge on is that it's important to transcend the self. So, so in the, as opposed to self-help, it becomes kind of self-mitigation. And that's important because like a book ends, the self also ends. We all end at some point. You know, we die. And so self-mitigation becomes important. And, and so it was through that series of kind of trap doors and stumbling that it evolved into this book. Uh, you know, in looking at your books, it seems, and I'm curious about this, like sort of bridging between a, a long-standing form, traditional in Lahore, but maybe not that available to anyone outside of there, and then taking the novel and connecting it to that, the novel which is not necessarily the dominant literary or cultural form in Lahore. You know, it seems like that idea of trying to bridge the gap between things is something that animates your work in other ways, that you talk a lot about being an outsider, right? That you're, you're from Lahore, but you've lived in the United States at multiple times through your lives. You've taken all these different roles. Anita talked about some of them, you know, from, um, lawyer to financier or to management consultant to author. Um, I, to what extent does the idea of the outsider interest you? I mean, it seems like most of your books are about outsiders. You is an outsider in his world. You know, it's sort of partly what leads to his downfall. You know, but Changez in The Reluctant Fundamentalist is an outsider and Daru and Muntaz are outsiders in some way. Yeah, I think that, that that's right. It's, it's very central to what, you know, to my view of, of the world uh, and my view of myself and my writing. Um, when I was younger, when I first came to America, I was three years old and my dad had gotten into a PhD program at Stanford. My father then and now uh, was and is a university professor. And um, in what field? In economics. Okay. Development economics, which is actually, uh, in a way, what this book is also playing yeah. with. Um, so I grew up with, you know, development economics and all this stuff being discussed at the dinner table. But uh, at age three, I came to California and I spoke Urdu fluently. Um, didn't speak a word of English. And my mother heard crying one day, stepped outside the identical townhouse in Escondido Village in which we and many other graduate student families live and saw me crying at the next house, surrounded by kids. And the kids said, you know, what's wrong with him? Why can't he speak? And my mother said, he can speak, he just doesn't speak English. Uh, they said, is he retarded? She said, no, he's not retarded. Um, came home, and I didn't speak for a month, apparently, after this, which is very unusual because I, I normally wouldn't go more than five minutes or even five seconds without speaking. And so, um, and a month later when I began to speak, I was speaking in full sentences in English with an American accent. 
And when I, at, at age nine, when I went back to Pakistan, my parents discovered that I'd forgotten Urdu. And I had to relearn Urdu at age nine. So, Urdu was my first language, but I lost it. English was my second language, but it's my best language. Urdu is now my third language, although it used to be my first. And so, you know, I'm somebody who, who I mean, I often feel like it's impossible to adequately communicate whatever it is I'm trying to say. And so I'm constantly trying to express myself, you know, better, I suppose. Um, and also, uh, I'm someone who can quite easily seem like an insider in many different places, but I don't really feel that it's true. So in Pakistan, walking down the street, people wouldn't know. And if they talked to me, they wouldn't know, oh, here's a guy who's lived half his life abroad. But I know. Mm -hmm. And similarly, if you put me in an office in New York City, very quickly, you know, I'm quite Americanized, or in London, uh, quite, you know, anglicized. You're but, fluid like capital. I'm like a chameleon in a way. Yeah, fluid like capital. Yeah. Ouch. Yes, that too. Um, but, but so the idea of being, you know, and when I was younger, what I, I tried to be like other people. So in Pakistan, I tried to be like other people in Pakistan, in America, like people in America, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And as I got older, I became more uncomfortable with this. I thought, look, I'm just going to be a slight misfit everywhere. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to try it. I'll, I'll try to fake it less than I have been. And one of the realizations that came to me once I started saying, okay, I'm a bit of a misfit everywhere, Pakistan, America, Britain. Um, one of the liberating things about accepting that about myself was I could look at other people and realize that every single one of them is a misfit as well. That actually being a kind of migrant is a universal human condition. You know, because we all migrate through time. So even if you were born in Chicago 80 years ago and you've lived here your whole life, you've never left the city. The Chicago that exists in 1934 doesn't exist anymore. The place of your childhood is gone. This Chicago is something else. You have moved. And so, and so I've, I've come to sort of feel that, that, that this, the feeling of being an outsider, actually, um, instead of being alienating, can be um, almost universal and something which unites people. Connecting, yeah. 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 So I guess in that sense, the notion of the outsider is central to everything I do not as an atypical condition, but actually as, uh, you know, uh, possibly the typical condition. When did you decide you wanted to write? The first um, uh, work of mine that is still in existence <laughs> is a, I think, 1977 um, pencil uh, in school copybook uh, galactic space opera with stick figures, uh, very much influenced by uh, Star, Wars Star Wars and, and uh, you know, Battlestar Galactica and Buck Rogers, the TV shows and movies I was watching in California in the 70s. Um, but I never thought that you know, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, but I was clearly doing it. And then when I went back to Pakistan, one weird thing happened, which is just before I left, I encountered this game called Dungeons and Dragons, which some of you will be familiar with. This is also a universal narrative, I think, yeah, for it, most it, men that's of right. a certain age. Well, but in Pakistan, it wasn't. This is the crazy thing. Yeah. So, like, Sufi poetry, there, universal. D&D, &D, much less so. Right. <laughs> and, and so I went, I encountered this game. I really found it fascinating. And in Dungeons and Dragons, basically, there's a... a, a a novelist-like figure who's the dungeon master who creates the world, and then various participant reader-like figures who have characters and they go out into this world and they have you know, swords and magic and they conquer dragons and get money and all sorts of things. It's meant to be played with a group. So I learned about this game and I moved to Pakistan where nobody plays Dungeons and Dragons. So I started kind of playing it by myself. <laughs> I would imagine creating the world and the character and have the adventures which, of course, is exactly what a novelist does. Yeah. I just didn't know it was, I mean, that's what I was doing. And it wasn't until I got to college and I took a creative writing course with, with uh, Joyce Carol Oates at Princeton and then one with Toni Morrison, where I suddenly realized, actually, this is what I've been doing pretty much my whole life and I like to do. And that's how I kind of thought of it as a profession. Um, but even more than a profession, I think it's always been just my way of dealing with life. You know telling stories and, and, and losing myself in, in stories. It's just how I am. So Joyce Carol Oates and Toni Morrison were your kind of formal uh, teachers of writing after the Dungeon Master. Yes. Um, so what did you learn 
from working with them? How did they shape you? Um, you know, I think that, uh, uh, well, in different ways. So, Joyce Carol Oates, what I thought was quite uh, spectacular about her was, I mean, she was very quick and, um, uh, and very direct. Mm -hmm. There was once a student in our class who had written a, a story called Fire. And, well, you know, I, don't, I didn't remember thinking it was very good, and, and clearly Joyce didn't think it was very good, because she sort of, you know, said, fire, hmm. <laughs> and then she sort of holds the story up and pretends to, you know, uh, light oh, it. Now, burn. yes, now, that is so useful early as a writer, I have to say. You know, there's so much, oh, you're great, it's fantastic. At least one person who gives you the respect of saying, this is what I really think about your work and I'm not going to couch it for you, was enormously helpful. Um, you know, she taught me uh, a kind of self-laceration. And at the same time, she was very supportive of my work then and since. Um, but really taught that, be as brutal with yourself as you can. Nobody should be more brutal with your writing than you are. Very useful to learn. Mm -hmm. Toni Morrison, um, I think among the things she taught me was she would read our stuff out loud. And Toni Morrison is probably the best reader of fiction, you know, in the English language today. She's not a bad writer, as I'm sure many of you are <laughs> <laughs> aware. Um, you know, Nobel and uh, Pulitzer Prize winning uh, writer. But, but she's an even better reader. And I can say this because even when she's reading somebody from our class or the newspaper or, you know, presumably the back of like a, you know, Kellogg's cornflakes box. Um, it sounds like beloved, you know, it sounds like <laughs> she would read it and you'd think, wow, I'm good. And the next person was, you know, wow, they're good. And, <laughs> and, and, and what I took away from that was uh, that how important it is to read your stuff out loud. And for me, a typical writing day consists of sitting at my desk typing into my computer for a couple of hours and three or four hours of pacing around with a printout, reading it over and over and over and over again out loud and trying to use my ears to sift out whatever pebbles I can find in the sand of the prose and never getting them all out, but just, you know, that's how I work. And that, that's what I learned from her. But more than specific things, I think what they both gave me was, you know, when you're in the proximity of people like that and they're treating your work seriously, it gives you permission to imagine that maybe your work is serious, um, and to take yourself a little more seriously than you might otherwise take yourself. Not too seriously, hopefully, but mm -hmm. enough to think, maybe I can do this. Um, and I think if I hadn't encountered them, if I'd just you know, been living in Lahore, I would never have imagined that I could be a novelist. Uh, so it was really important, I think, both of those uh, two teachers. Um. What did your family think about all of that? I mean, because obviously you're taking this path that is different than, um, you know, I mean, not that it doesn't lead there, obviously it did in your case, but you're going, you're pursuing other areas of study, you're getting a law degree. What was your family's reaction to this kind of slowly emerging desire or expression of writing? Well, I mean, in the Desi community, the South Asian community, um, the notion that a kid went to Princeton has now decided to take time off and work on a novel, um, back in the early 1990s when I did it, was generally perceived to be close to madness. You know, uh, uh, like, don't, like you're really indulging this kid, you know, get him into grad school ASAP or into some you know, respectable bank stroke, hospital stroke, you know, whatever other profession. Um, my parents were quite good about not doing that. And uh, partly I think they, they too were shaped by the California experience of the 1970s. Um, and partly because uh, I, there's way back there's sort of atypical um, behaviors in my family. My, my father's father um, was from a family that was part of a system that's, that's called, what well, I guess you call it, a, a Piri Muridi system. I don't know, there's no translation in English, but effectively there are people who some believe to be descended from the Prophet Muhammad. Mm -hmm. and who are then venerated um, and who very often then exploit the veneration to take advantage of the various, you know, poor people who are, uh, and not so poor people who ascribe to them these, uh, I mean, it's just this terrible and enduring thing. And my grandfather uh, chose when his father died 
um, to reject this and sold his land and shipped himself off to the UK and, and got educated as an engineer and then came back to then India and later Pakistan. His wife, my grandmother, um, was uh, in the first class of women to graduate from university in Pakistan that accepted women and then f founded the all, well, was one of the early chairwomen, chairpersons of the All Pakistan Women's Association, so an early Pakistani feminist. So a lot of people in the family have been doing weird you know, things for a while, um, which gave cover for this kind of behavior. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but yeah, there, was, there were a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of sort of puzzled um, uh, you know, comments. Although one other thing which is probably worth saying is, uh, I give my parents a lot of credit for saying, you know, go son, be free and chase your dream. Um, but I had gotten into Harvard Law School and deferred for a year. So, <laughs> so even the South Asian parent, you know, genes, uh, they could at least say, well, he was going to go and do something real with his life. Um, but, uh, and then when I, when I more recently, about five years ago, just started writing full time and doing nothing else, at that point I was, you know, pretty grown up and it was, it was okay. But um, I didn't get too much of that, of that pushback. Now, interestingly, many young people in Pakistan that I meet are thinking about careers in writing. I just didn't know anybody who was and I couldn't really imagine it for myself. Uh, it's still hard to imagine it for myself. People are, writing is becoming a popular choice. A more popular choice. Why do you think that is? Well, I think um, there are always going to be some people who are predisposed towards being writers. Um, but until recently, very few of them could imagine that you know, it was a career as such or something that you could do and make a living at. And the terrible thing is when a few people start making a living at something, then suddenly people think, oh, well, you know, it can't be that hard. <laughs> um, and so, they don't know about your seven draft process. I know, the, the, the 15 years of, of non-full-time writing that I did. Yeah. But um, it's, 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 it's very interesting, you know, I meet so many young people now uh, in Pakistan who are working on novels, working on short stories, and interestingly, many of them are writing in English, and many of them are first-generation English speakers and first-generation college students. So, you'll, you know, I meet young people who um, will insist on speaking to me in English, you know, in Pakistan, and they'll ask me, you know, so I'm, I want to be a writer, I'm working on this, what's your suggestion? Like, how do I, what should I do about this and whatever? And, uh, um, and I've come to sort of feel that, you know, we, we often talk about writing as though it's the people who get published and the reviews and it's, you know, people who get to speak to you and people, you know, who are, um, but there's something else, which is there's a much broader group of people for whom expressing themselves by writing things down and imaginary things um, is a hugely important activity and is part of the exact same thing. You know, we, we, we have this um, like professionalized world where, okay, well, there are books that get published and they get reviewed and they get priced and they're meaningful. But, um, but they aren't really any more meaningful than the individual human being sitting down by themselves and taking the time to enter this world in imagination. You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, it's 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 not about being a writer; it's about writing. And lots and lots and lots of young people are writing now, and that's really exciting to me. And uh, it's a big change. I wonder if. Um when you started at the beginning talking about, you know, you didn't really set out to write a book about religion, and, but, you know, thinking about the way religion is politicized, it occurs to me that, you know, reading this novel, you have, an, you have the possibility, writers have the possibility of addressing topics like religion, like politics, money, sex, that we really don't talk about in polite company, quote yeah. unquote, or even in the public sphere, they become these kind of fault lines, you know, points through over which we argue more than points around which we come together. I mean, is that part of the appeal for you that you can? I think it is part of the appeal, you know. Um, there's so much that's unsayable. Yeah. And perhaps there's more unsayable in Pakistan than there, are other, uh, there is in the United States, but there's stuff that's unsayable here too. Um, and, and the ways in which we self-censor are, are you know, so many. Um, we might censor out of a sense of you know, political correctness, or we might self-censor self -censor out of self-preservation, or 
you know, just professional um, savviness or whatever, a lot of stuff occurs to us that doesn't get voiced. It gets silenced, and, and, m and much of it, you know, thankfully gets silenced because I'm sure a lot of horrific stuff would be said if it wasn't. <laughs> but but um, in Pakistan, it's clear that, you know, huge, there's a huge terrain um, about which, you know, speech is dangerous. Um, and uh, I mean, as an example of this, so uh, uh, one of my my, my mother-in-law's uh, best friend uh, was the wife of the governor of the Punjab, the province of Pakistan in which I live, and he began speaking out very forcefully um, uh, to say that the blasphemy law as existed in Pakistan was being used to victimize Christians, um, and he was assassinated. And, you know, so, so it's clear that there are limits on speech, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, the, the fiction, I think, um, is quite interesting because um, you can get at ideas and concepts and you can, um, uh, there's, there's a way to navigate, you know, what is unsayable and to make it sayable. And so Sufi poetry, for example, which we already talked about tonight, but um, why does it exist? You know, why take this poetic, love poetic form? Like, why does Rumi write the way Rumi writes? Um, and Hafiz and Ghalib. Um, why is you know, some of the great poetry of the last thousand years in this tradition? Uh, partly it's because there were Sufis like uh, Mansur al-Halaj a thousand years ago, you know, who said, um, things about religion or spirituality, about the divine nature of the individual human being, for example, which got them into such trouble that you know, Al-Halaj was crucified and then burnt um, at the stake uh, in Baghdad uh, a thousand years ago. And, and so then um, uh, metaphorical traditions and poetic traditions evolved to say, okay, how do we express these views um, in a way that doesn't get you crucified and burnt at the stake? And, and, and all of this, you know, this poetic and other traditions were born and were enormously successful because, you know, in a place like Lahore, uh, uh, the city where I live, it's a city of 10 million people. Um, the most venerated place in Lahore is the shrine of Data Ganjbaksh, uh, uh, a Sufi writer, uh, a thousand years old, a thousand years ago. Uh, who even now, every, you know, his, his people come to his shrine and they, you know, it's, it's one of the central hubs around which the city is built. Mm -hmm. And um, he's a writer. So, so I think that actually, you know, finding ways to, um, you know, to, to finding modes of expression that, that can disarm um, certain kinds of defensiveness uh, uh, is really important. And... Um, and it's particularly important, I think, in a place like Pakistan, but it's important everywhere. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I think that, you know, for me, that is, um, uh, that is you know, a big part of the project, which is to say, what, you know, what, I don't know what can be said, nobody knows, but to try to express what you want to express in a way which doesn't result in your being, you know, forced to, let's say, leave a place. Like, what I don't want to do is to perhaps you know, um, live a life in exile right. and pronounce from over here unheard. Um, I mean, obviously that can happen to anybody. Uh, but I think it's very different to live inside a culture and to hopefully within a culture continue to speak and to, you know, uh, uh, put forward ideas um, and have them, you know, ripple around. And that's, that's partly what I try to do. Um, let's ripple some ideas. Um, we want to have your questions and comments as well. So on both sides of the space, there are women with microphones. So just, yeah, put your hand in the air. Hello. Um, I Hi. teach high school English here in Chicago, and I've taught your book, Moss Smoke, for many years now. Mm -hmm. And last year, we had a foreign exchange student from Pakistan, and he took the class. And he didn't know of you, and he, he didn't know the book. I found it curious that he didn't know of you. He said, oh, he's captured Pakistan perfectly in this novel. 
But I guess the question I'm asking is, is it taught in any schools in, in Pakistan? Or, and I, it, wasn't there a television series or something? It, it, it was adapted for, uh, for TV in Pakistan, a little mini-series. Um, it's, I mean, Mott Smoke, uh, um, most of my books aren't taught in the secondary school level. I mean, there's a lot of sex and drugs and whatnot in Mott Smoke, and so um, it, it, it probably was a, was a tough one to put on the syllabus. Um, but that said, uh, lots of young people sort of pass it you know, along. Um, it's kind of a, 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 one of these books that, that 20-somethings and teenagers seem to keep passing on to each other. Russell Banks once told me, I, he had a book out, and I asked him in the fall about a book which came out in the spring. You know, how, how did it do? Are you happy with it? He says, too soon to say. I said, well, wasn't it like six months ago? He says, yeah. But it's not until a book has been out for at least 10 years that you begin to have a sense of how it's doing. And I loved that. I thought, you know, that's so, what a beautiful way to think about it. It's not this year's sales or prizes or reviews. It's, you know, way out in the future. So Mott Smoke is my only novel which is over 10 years old. And so now I can begin to see what it does. And what it seems to be doing is it is passed along young people, um, but not in school. And uh, 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 my books are, are pretty widely, um, I guess, assigned at the university level in Pakistan. Um, but uh, as an example of, of, uh, of moth smoke, I was at uh, the Karachi Literary, Fe the Literary Festival uh, last year. And this young man waited till my talk was over and came up and shook my hand and said, I wanted to give you this. And he gave me a little folded letter. And, and I opened, he left and he, I opened the letter and said, you know, dear sir, there are three of us who are your big fans in a small village near Rahim Yar Khan. And Rahim Yar Khan is sort of out in the middle of, middle of nowhere is incorrect. Actually, it's right in the center of Pakistan, but it's far removed from the big cities of Lahore and Karachi and Islamabad. Um, and there's three of us out in this place and we read your work, and we're big fans, and um, in particular, we're bad fans of Mott Smoke, and what we like about Mott Smoke very much are the drug and sex scenes <laughs> at Mott Smoke. And, They're and, very well done. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and, and, um, and when we read the Latin Fundamentalist, there really wasn't that much, you know, of the drug and sex. And, and we hope that in your future work, <laughs> you won't let us down, and you'll keep in mind, um, and this is somebody, in this letter he said that the three of them chipped together money so that he could hop on a bus and come, you know, a thousand kilometers Aww. over 16 hours to Karachi to give me this letter and then go back to where it came from. That is adorable. So that's a, that's wow. a pretty hardcore, you know, <laughs> so in, in regard to your question, uh, uh, people do find it, but it perhaps is not encouraged in many school, uh, secondary school uh, curriculum. Uh, we're going back here. Good evening. I'm with the Pakistan Club at the University of Chicago, and we are working with your agent to invite you to the Pakistan Club in the fall. But my quick two-part question is, you talked about the early influence on you of Joyce Carol Oates and Toni Morrison. How do you connect that influence with what you write about, Pakistan, Pakistani Americans, Muslims, so on and so forth? And speaking of connecting the dots, do you still see yourself and people of, your, of similar heritage as misfits? Because we all have multiple identities, but we are not necessarily misfits. So have you changed your opinion on it? Thank you. When I use the term misfit or mongrel or whatever, I actually mean it in a good way. Um, I think that, it's, that, that, uh, um, that the idea of feeling a certain degree of questioning and refusal to accept what is given inside of society and feeling outside of those assumptions and questioning those assumptions, to me, is a very, very good thing. You know, Gandhi was a misfit. Uh, Jinnah was a misfit. You know, um, I mean, so many figures in, in South Asian history, they see history, are you know, uh, misfits in different ways. They've from atypical backgrounds. They've studied abroad. They've done all these things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think it's great. So, so please don't don't think that I'm being in any way um, trying to say that people you know of these kind of backgrounds are less or anything else. I think, I think, though, the reason why I bring it up is that the impulse to, while being aware of a certain kind of dissonance uh, inside yourself, to then say, I'm going to try to ignore that 
and just be Pakistani or just be American uh, when I actually feel a bit of both. That, I think, actually is dangerous. Um, you know, it's, it's for me a better thing to, in, in any scenario, to say, look, if you're a hybridized, mongrelized person, you know, don't deny that about yourself. Uh, so, so to your misfit point, uh, I mean, misfit sounds like a bad word, but, um, but I don't intend it to be a bad, bad word. I think, I think it's, it's misfits who help all people fit in everywhere. <laughs> um, and then as far as the connecting the dots are concerned, I can't really connect the dots from like Joyce Carol Oates and Toni Morrison to my, to my present work in any direct way. Um, you know, uh, all I can say is that, uh, uh, that you know, there huge, there's a huge impact um, from having, you know, encountered writers like that and having had them take the time to look at my work. And, you know, I'm, I, it's, it's, a depth, it's a real debt of, of, of gratitude. Um, but also, um, it, for me, there's a kind of respect which comes from the notion that, you know, what was I to them? I mean, I'm a student and they were a teacher, so in, in the theory, I was, you know, there's some relationship there. But, but really, it was, you know, that it's an open practice, this thing of trying to express yourself through written words. Um, and, and to be, you know, considered a member of this practice. Nobody needs to confer membership upon you. But, but sometimes when people do, um, it, it, it can be very powerful. And so what I learned in that sense from them, much more than how I write, is how I approach other people who come to me and talk to me about their writing. Which is, which is not to say that you have something to prove to be in my group, but which is to say, if you are thinking of such things, then you and I are already in the same group. My name is Lolita. I'm from, originally from India. Uh, my question is, you talked a lot about Sufism and the humanity in the religion, which I fully agree with. And in the Indian subcontinent, we have rich history of literature, culture. So were you influenced by any of the, uh, you know, legendary figures, the literary, like the literary figures uh, from Indian subcontinent, I mean Pakistan, India, or Bangladesh? If you are, who were those people, or maybe who are, and how? I mean, from a, a fiction writing standpoint, the one that uh, uh, I was probably most influenced by was, was uh, Manto. Um, Saad Hassan Manto was a short story writer, for those who don't know his work, wrote in Urdu, lived for a time in Lahore, also in Bombay. Um, wrote really gritty um, and just great uh, short stories, you know, often profane, um, uh, about misfits, interestingly enough. And um, so, very much so, and in fact so much so that there's a character in Mott Smoke who sort of takes a uh, a writing name uh, of Manto. Um, beyond that, the, which we've already talked about, but there's a poetic tradition, you know, of poets like, you know, Ghalib and Faz and um, uh, who, um, to be honest, I have never read that much poetry, I didn't read that much poetry growing up, I should say. But you're surrounded by it in Lahore. You know, you turn on the TV and you're sitting next to your grandfather as a child or your grandmother and they're watching, you know, uh, a Kavali or they're watching, you know, a recital. Um, my wife is a Dili Girana, you know, classical singer and the lyrics of, that she sings is, you know, often uh, uh, in, in, when she sings folk music or whatever. Uh, she saw, sang a song called uh, Kandin Nana on the soundtrack of Latin Fundamentalist. Um, a lot of my friends are singers. Uh, a lot of the stuff that they sing is, has a, you know, either poetic or traditional, you know, roots. Um, so I feel very much, I guess, part of that word, world. And I've read, you know, I, I, to be honest, I haven't read that much um, of, of, you know, Bangladeshi uh, 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 literature from, or literature from Bengal, I should say, from olden times, but if contemporary Bangladeshi fiction, like Tamima Anam and all, are, is, a, is a friend of mine. Um, Amit Chaudhary, speaking of Calcutta, is a, you know, I mean, there's a large number of, of South Asian writers, but um, yeah, I mean, that's the beginning. I, I read quite widely among South Asian writers today, but I read, I read in English. So, um, uh, so I encounter most Desi writing 
uh, in English. And I've read, you know, I've read um, uh, sort of you know, Hindu sacred texts and I've read, uh, uh, I'm really, I'm pretty omnivorous. I, whatever I can encounter, I, I try to check out. Hi, I'm an aspiring novelist and sometimes I get consumed um, by the notion of privacy or the lack of thereof. And I was wondering, is that something that consumes you? Privacy, you know, having a family, children, being so successful, how does that affect you? I guess, I guess what I would say is I, I try to kind of compartmentalize my life a little bit. So there are moments when I come and I come into in the public space and I speak and, you know, I travel around the world. Um, and, and, and that I do in part because you meet very interesting people when you do that and also in part because that's the chance that you have when you've done a new book or something that hopefully readers who might like what you've written at that chance will have a chance of finding your work if you go and speak about it. Um, but most of the time I actually try to stay completely cut off. So I try not to give interviews, I try not to uh, speak in public, I try not to do any of that kind of stuff. Um, and particularly when I'm writing, I try to really just shut that down. Um, uh, I, think, I think that, in a sense, one thing, the nice thing about living in Lahore is you're, you're far removed from the sort of celebrity literary culture of living in London or New York. Um, and, uh, uh, and that's good in a way because um, as a writer, I always feel that like, my job is to watch, you know, not to be watched really. The other aspect, of course, is to what extent do you keep private your own life and keep it separate from your fiction? Um, and that's something which everybody does for themselves in different ways. Uh, there, I, mean, I think, I think the, the maxim, you know, first do no harm is probably not a bad one, personally. So, so I try to avoid, you know, the kind of writing where it's, oh, this is really my uncle and I've revealed that, you know, he is a pedophile or something like this. It's, it's you know, um, uh, I, I don't have any interest in, in revealing uh, the inside you know, lives of actual other people. Um, mm. But that said, if you do, I don't think that that's wrong. Um, uh, but, uh, but I at least would be um, more protective of other people's privacy than my own. And when writing about yourself, it's hard to do so without violating other people's privacy. But it's a navigation everybody has to do for themselves. It's very tricky. Hi, thank you for speaking. So now I'm in law school and I've always had this idea I, I want to write whether on the side or full time. And you spoke about your parents being very supportive. So my question is, for people of South Asian background that don't necessarily have the most supportive parents in this regard, if hypothetically, if, if I was my dad, what would you say to me to convince me <laughs> that you should let your son, you know, potentially drop out of law school and write for time. Thank you. You know, it's, um, my parents were supportive. I'm not necessarily convinced that that is a good thing. And I'll tell you why. It's because at the end of the day, um, uh, there have been so many times, you know, in the 20 odd years I've been writing novels, um, that I have been completely lost you know, emotionally, but also in, in the, you know, professionally and in every other sense. Um, and uh, I think if the compulsion in you is strong enough, you'll find your way. Um, and so I guess in terms of now, how, if, I, if I were offering up the, the advice from that standpoint, I guess if, if, it, were, if it were my son or my daughter who are asking me, who are asking me this question and knowing what I do about writing fiction, which is that actually it's not a very easy way to make a living, to be honest with you. Um, it really comes down to is, is, you know, how essential is it to you? And if it is essential, um, then do it. Uh, but don't burden it with, um, uh, with a financial uh, or, or professional um, weight that it may not be able to sustain. In other words, if you need to write, write. Um, and then if it turns out that from your writing you can write full-time, um, great. 
But if it means that you will do something else and also write, that is also great. That's what I've done for most of my career. And if I had to do it again tomorrow, I would do it in a heartbeat. The, the real question is how badly do you need to write? And, and if, you're, if you don't know, and I don't think anybody knows until they've done it for a while, the best thing is just to write. And then you'll find out. And along the way, you'll either find out that you just need to do this, in which case you must do it. There's no other way around it. And you know, one of the things which is very important to say is that, um, I mean, I do regard writing now as a kind of spiritual practice. It's like meditation or like praying or like something like that. You know, it, it's um, most of my friends who are writers, um, you know, who are doing it now. I mean, I have a friend who's uh, Akhil Sharma, who's got a novel coming out this year. He's been working on it for 12 years, wow. or 13 years. He's been stuck for most of that time, and he's just been working and working and working and working and working. You know, what is that if not a kind of you know, spiritual devotion? It's something there. He wasn't making any money off of the thing. It was just sitting there for 13 years. So I would say you know, enter into the, into the practice of this thing and then see, see where it goes. This will be our last question. Reading your three books, one comes away with a feeling that they're all three love stories just told differently. I mean, if one just thinks about the book, the thing that one remembers most is, oh, this is a sad love story. What do you think from that angle? I think it's true. I mean, I, I don't exactly know what other kind of stories there are. I'm sure there must be some other type of stories. And I guess people do write them. Um, I, I, I kind of, you're right, I'm sort of stuck on the idea of the love story. And uh, uh, there's, there's, you know, oftentimes, I remember when I first encountered this notion, I think I was in America or Europe, and somebody talked about sentimentality. Um, and I thought about, you know, what can that possibly mean? You know, sentimentality. Um, the notion of excessive sentiment or of being lost in sentiment. Um, I was taught to think that, uh, that, you know, to be lost in sentiment is actually a wonderful, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of elevation, a transcendence. It's an aspect to aspire to. Um, and maybe I just got things wrong, and I'm, I'm you know, um, but uh, uh, at the end of the day, for me, um, it seems that a uh, big part of the reason to write is to communicate. Um, and you know to go beyond yourself, and uh, you know, and in that sense, you know, what else is love except the ability to um, endow someone outside of yourself with feelings that normally are you know kept within? So I I, I think that uh, uh, the very act of writing you know is is a kind of loving act. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it is very true that, that my books are all love stories. The one I'm thinking about right next is also a love story. And, um, and I like reading love stories too. So, uh, so I guess I'm just a, a sap, basically. So you are, I mean, I know that was the last question, but you are working on another novel? Yeah, I'm always working on another novel and, and I'm usually failing at it. You know, there's this, this thing that, that, that I really have taken to heart um, the advice of Douglas Adams of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, who says uh, in, that, in one of those books um, that the secret to flying is throwing yourself at the ground and missing. <laughs> and so what I do is I throw myself at the ground and hit, you know, repeatedly, <laughs> repeatedly, and hopefully by the fifth or sixth or seventh draft and the sixth or seventh year of working on a project, it flies. Um, so right now I've done a couple of drafts and they've really hit the ground very hard. Uh, but hopefully I'll miss uh, soon. Thank you so much, Thank Mohsen Hamed. Thank all of you. Thank you.